We're going to be taking our message today from John chapter 2, cleansing of the temple, starting at verse 3, I mean uh, verse 13. And you can be looking for that. <clears throat> and I'm going to read from Malachi chapter, I believe it's 3, that sets the pref the, 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 I guess I'd say the prophetic mindset of Christ leading up to this situation so that you know that Jesus Christ already from eternity past has something in mind that he's going to perform that day. Because remember, Jesus is God. Jesus Christ knows all, sees all, but it's God in the flesh now. But he has told us something back in Malachi. And so while you're preparing uh, to follow along with me in John chapter 2, starting at verse 13, I'm going to read from Malachi. And after I read from Malachi, then uh, I'll pray over the, the message that God would bless us. While well, I'm going to Malachi, I want you to know that it's a great blessing to me to be able to be here at Cross of Calvary and to share uh, the Word of God with you. And by the way, I, I think someone left some gigantic shoes back here that I can't quite fill. <laughs> Make sure Spencer takes all of his shoes with him next time when he goes on a trip. It's kind of intimidating. All right. So while you're, you're going there, I'm going to read this from Malachi. I will send my, message, my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. That's John. And the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord. But who may abide in the day of his coming? And who shall stand when he appeareth? And he is a refiner, refiner's fire, like fuller's soap. And he shall sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. And he shall purify the sons of Levi. Those are the priests who, who perform the temple functions. And purge them as gold and silver that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. That is a prophecy that one day... The Messiah is going to come and he's going to set things right in a, in a temple or a sacrificial system that has gone wrong. So I want you to understand that what happens at the cleansing of the temple is not something that Jesus did on the spur of the moment. From eternity past, he has planned for this moment. And this is the mindset that when things go wrong inside the temple at that time, which represented the sacrifices, which were the avenue to, to God at that time, when God comes in to those types of situations, which are religious situations, the Spirit of God is that He wants to set those things to what is right. So now I'll go on, go on over to John and get ready here. First, go with me to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank You for this day, and we pray, Lord, that You would bless Your Word. Lord, we know that we need to hear it, Lord. We pray that you would feed us. You said to Peter, feed my sheep. Well, Lord, we pray today, Lord, that you would feed us, Lord. Help me to feed the sheep, Lord. I ask for your blessing, Lord, in the preaching. I ask for your blessing in the hearing, Lord. I pray that we wouldn't be passive in hearing your message, Father, that we would be actively thinking on it, using our intellect, Father, using our spirit, using praying in our heart, Lord, as we hear the word, Father, looking to absorb it into ourselves so that we won't be just hearers of the word, Lord. That would be dangerous. I pray, Father, that you'd make us fruitful by making us hearers and doers of the word, Father. But if we don't hear it, Father, if we don't understand it, we won't be able to do it, Father. So I pray that you'd give us a heart for that end. In the name of Jesus Christ, in the name of Jesus Christ alone, amen. And the Jews pass over was at hand and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. This is right after the turning of the water into wine miracle. This was the entry point of Jesus into what we call his official ministry at this time. But somebody in his family has already been ministering already. His name's John the Baptist, his cousin. John the Baptist, one of the things that had marked his ministry is that he was in conflict of his own ad admission. He's in conflict with a lot of the individuals and the sacrificial system going on in Jerusalem. And that's why when they come to him, he says, you know, who warned you to flee the wrath to come? And he calls them vipers. Well, it looks like his cousin 
also has a mindset that is on a collision course with the sacrificial system, not just as a sacrificial system, but as something has gone wrong with something that God meant for good. And so he's going to continue on with this type of mentality. And so it's at the Passover time, and the Passover goes back to Exodus, when the Jews were freed from Egypt, and that's the first Passover, when the Lamb's blood was put, put on the doorpost. And that was the sign, and it was a beginning, and it was a ritual that they did every year. And we continue that with Easter, basically, now that Christ has come and fulfilled all things. So this is an important time. This is not an insignificant time in Jerusalem. Jesus, I believe, according to Malachi, I believe that he comes into this situation with something on his mind. I think he comes into the situation with intention to do something. I think he knows exactly what he's going to do. Because I don't think that Jesus is ignorant of what's going on there. Jesus is now about 30 years old and he's coming to the temple most likely every year. As a lot of the good Orthodox Jews would do, they would come to the temple every year. But I believe that until now, he has been silent on something he has seen that is growing and that is corrupting. But after the official entry into ministry at uh, the turning of the water of wine into Cana, he comes into Jerusalem and scholars argue over, is this, a, is this a second cleansing of the temple? Because over in Matthew 21, around verse 12, we see that there's a cleansing that basically is what gets him killed over in Matthew because it's almost just before he gets crucified. I'm of the mind that these are two cleansings, which just shows you the courage and the boldness that Jesus Christ has to pull this off twice, much less once. So he comes into a situation in Jerusalem. It says he goes into the temple and he sees those who are, who are selling oxen and sheep and doves and the changers of money, and he sees them there. Well, I believe that this is a situation that shows the courage of Christ. He comes in here, he sees what's been going on. I believe this has been going on for years. So what happens is what he's fixing to do is extremely radical. And I do want you to understand that most of the time, as a faithful person, someone filled with the Holy Spirit, most of the time it's time to be reasonable. Most of the time it's time to be persuasive. Most of the time it's a time to be gentle. Most of the time, not all the time. And this is one of those times. Now, Jesus Christ definitely has the authority to do what he's fixing to do. But I do want you to understand that I disagree with many scholars who believe that this is something unique only to Christ. No. Jesus Christ functions as a man who is standing for what is right. And he's fixing to face off with a total system that is wrong. Alone because nobody fully understands what he's going to do, but he has intended this for a long time. So there are certain situations where you don't feel like acting out in a, an abrupt way. This would be one of those things, the Passover time in Jerusalem, at the temple. This is like you just don't come into church and just do anything at the time. There's almost an atmosphere of certain events that gives you somewhat of a, uh, a structure around you, something that somewhat controls you a little bit to guard yourself, to be on your best behavior, to be possibly as congenial as possible, maybe more than you normally are in certain situations. This is one of those types of situations where you just do what you're supposed to do. Jesus does not do that in this situation. So when he finds them there, and right there at that verse it says that they were sitting, I want you to understand that what they were doing was wrong. And now I'm going to explain the structure of this animal sacrifices and the selling. Why are they there? It says that they are in the temple. They're not in what we'd call the temple proper. So what we would imagine is that pretend that there is a massive uh, type of uh, maybe a wall that would surround the entire property of Cross of Calvary, the entire property. And think of the parking lot probably being paved and it's more like a massive courtyard and this is what's called in the Old Testament the court of the Gentiles and this is a play where, place where it was acceptable for the Gentiles to be because there was a type of encouragement kind of a, a medium area there that they could be in there but no Gentile could pass beyond that point but this was a massive area well all the temple was dedicated unto God for the purpose of worship and for prayer we find that over in uh, Isaiah God intended that this would be a house of prayer and all the sacrificial system would happen here. Well, 
what happens is that now they have brought in a situation that did not always exist. I want you to understand that this did not always exist, the situation. What happened is they had to come on the Passover to do certain animal sacrifices to have their sins covered. Out of convenience, they now brought in animals into the courtyard of the Gentiles. And this was not supposed to be. This was not always done. So basically, they've turned the court of the Gentiles into a cell barn. Anyone ever been to a cell barn? Maybe you grew up in a country town? I was out by one in Jones when I was growing up. I went to high school in Choctaw. I'd go out to the cell barn sometimes. Well, basically, now they're selling animals in the temple area. It's a cell barn. You have oxen all over the place. You have all kinds of things going on in this situation. Basically, these people have no reverence for the things of God and believe that they have such a familiarity with them that for convenience sake, they can begin to manipulate the functions as long as they can tie them somehow to the actions of God. Beware convenience. Not a, just everything can be done because it's convenient. Things can become convenient to us, but they interfere with what God's intentions are. And I fear that in the modern world, particularly in the United States, that now we perform things in church in such a way that all things are for our convenience, because convenience is a reference to us, not to God. Remember, it is good, it is right to do things right. Sometimes you have to be put out of your way. Sometimes the convenience is not what always is necessary. Sometimes you need a loss of convenience on yourself because of things of God. It's inconvenient when you want to do what you want to do to go to church on Sunday. It's inconvenient sometimes to uh, give a tithe. Sometimes these things can be very inconvenient. But the will of God is that you perform your duties to Him regardless, and you do not manipulate them. Because very rarely does someone just say, I just don't want to do these things because they're not convenient. Rarely do people say that. Normally, they have to tie it into the current system that's going on and say, not only is this convenient, it's convenient in a means that it serves the purposes of God. It seems like more and more and more things grow that way. But we're going to see that they are relaxed. They are sitting. You see that? They have no notion that anything is wrong. The corruption of the situation has corrupted to the point that they're comfortable in it. They're fixing to become very uncomfortable because Jesus Christ comes to make sinful intrusions into his revelation to people, his connection to people, when there are sinful intrusions that become ox obstacles involved in these situations, he comes to make those things uneasy. He comes to make those things uncomfortable. Sometimes the best sermons you ever hear, and I bet you hear a lot of them here, are things that are somewhat uncomfortable. I know because I used to come to this church. And there's something about a good cleansing sermon that sets things to right. It feels good. Now, if it just flat out never feels good to you, well, you have to check on something there. Okay? Here is the truth. The gospel is at odds with men who are hostile towards God in their minds, according to Paul. And I believe that the truth of God will perform a work in church and wherever it's at, not just in church, in such a way that the saints feed off of it. The truth, the cleansing truth that purifies them is good. It tastes good. There's something about it that somewhat hurts a bit, but something about it purifies and you feel it. Those people come to the church and they can't get enough of it. And then you have the others that come to the church and it agitates them. But it's good. When they feel that agitation, and I don't know if you'll feel an agitation today. I don't want you to feel an agitation today. But sometimes it just simply is because the gospel is that way. And that agitation is driving you one of two different ways. You will get saved or you will get out. 
or you will stay and be miserable for a long time and maybe get saved later. But you're going to be miserable living in sin in the presence of the preached Word of God and the revelation of Jesus Christ because it is uncomfortable. And that's what he does. And he decides that he's going to make a scourge of cords. This is a whip. This is an object that you wouldn't want to see coming at you. This is not the image that we normally think of Christ during the gospel time. He takes the time and the skill to twist and make something that would drive fear into hearts of people seeing it coming towards them. He has something in mind. I believe that it's possible that he may have made this before he showed up. I don't know. It seems like it would take a little time. I think that it may be possible that Jesus Christ showed up with this on him, ready to go. I believe his mindset was with a purpose. I believe his mindset was come to get something done. He was going to make a statement that day, and they were going to hear it, and they were going to hear it loud. And it says, then he drove them all out of the temple. It says, the sheep and the oxen, and, the, and poured out the changers' money and overthrew the tables. He has brought the whole system to a stop, maybe just for one day, because I believe that this is the first time at the beginning of his ministry, he brings it to a stop for that one day and bookends his life. He starts his ministry with it, and then he forces a closing of his ministry by doing it again at the end of his ministry, and they kill him for it later. So what happens is he has done something. Well, I want to inform you guys of something. I study on this. Now, see, the, the commentators really want to argue back and forth over whether or not this whip was used on people. It says he drove them all out. Now, I don't know if anybody got hit with a whip, but I don't think that Jesus Christ makes such an object in vain. I don't think it's purely symbolic when you go into that situation. What it was, he drove them out just like the animals. Hopefully they wised up and just saw the animals running and got out. I want you to understand that this is a situation that is unheard of. This is courageous. This is not a time. And I want you to know that this is not something usual in the Christian's life. It is normally time to be persuasive. It's time to be reasonable. It's time to be congenial. Almost all the time. But sometimes you face a corruption in the system. Now this doesn't mean that just any system you rebel against. This is talking about the most important one there is. That is the sacrificial system. That your access to God is everything. That one thing. You don't see Jesus take a whip to the Romans. You don't see him take a whip to all kinds of situations. You see him having dinner with Pharisees. You see him in all kinds of situations being congenial with them, but making things right, saying the right things. But in this situation, it's pure, raw action at this point. Because there comes a time when the pollution has become so monolithic that one man has to stand, or woman, in that moment, and they have to take rash action. And you will have that moment in your life when you personally will be alone. You will be alone. And you must stand at that moment and having done all to stand in that evil day that you face at that moment. But if you don't know the Word of God, you don't have it in you, you will not have the courage to do what's right and you won't do it. And it will be something you regret. There comes moments like this, and I'm not saying they're all the time, but they do come. And that came for Christ right here. And they are no longer comfortable. He is not going to make them comfortable in this situation. So, I want you to understand that these animals are being sold here for sacrificial reasons. Okay? But the money changers, how are they connected? The money changers, we still have money changers today. But I won't get into that. I won't talk about Wall Street and everything that's going on today. I won't talk about the Federal Reserve and how all that works. We still have money changers today. But what happens here is that they do not accept the defiled pagan money that's coming into the temple to be able to purchase the animals for the purposes of sacrificing to God. So there is an exchange of temple money for the pagan money that's coming in. It doesn't say here, but do you guys suppose that there might have been a little charge on there? Do you think that it was probably just straight across my 25 cent pagan coin for your 25 cent temple coin? 
It does not say here, and I bet if you were to research it, you would find some interesting things about it. Okay? Well, you've got to pay for the service somehow, right? I mean, it's just reasonable. We're providing this wonderful service to people. Okay, so imagine the situation. People would have to bring their animals from cross-country if this wasn't being conveniently provided for them inside the temple. Convenience. We wouldn't want to be inconvenienced by sacrificing to God. The whole notion of sacrifice is inconvenient. It is inconvenient. It was inconvenient for God to send His only Son for us. It is inconvenient. It is not convenient at all. Sacrifice, by definition, is not convenient. It's inconvenient. And if it's convenient, it's not sacrifice. So, to be able to get the animal, which was pre-approved and wouldn't be rejected by the priest, by the way, so that was really nice. So you didn't have to worry about anything. Everything's done for you. It's convenient. It's like Mick Church. Oh, thank you very much. So, but anyway, and so, but there's one thing that he doesn't do. He hasn't turned out the doves yet. And he turns to those who are selling doves, and he just talks to them. Probably because the notion of trying to get the doves out would be a little bit different than trying to drive animals out. They'll just fly all over the place, and he doesn't want them flying all over the interior of the temple and things like this. But he turns to them, he says, get these things hence. Make not my father's house a house of merchandise. Now here's what I want to set straight. Jesus is not infuriated. He is not disturbed by this at this moment. And I want to go on and say this. The disciples remember that it is written, the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. From Psalms, I believe, 89. And so what happens here? What is making him so angry? Here is not what is making him angry. He is not angry that their business actions are corrupt. That is not what's making him angry. He's not angry that it is a corrupted business system. He's not angry that it's a corrupt corporation. He's angry that it has become a business at all. Merchandise, period. He doesn't say, oh, well, y'all, we're being unfair in how you're doing this. No, it's not the purpose of God's actions in sacrifice and his temple and his word and the Bible and church. It's not his intention at all for it to be a business in any sense, even in the best possible sense. And this is exactly what you have in most of the church mentality today. It is not a business. It does not function for profit other than to profit men's souls. And if you come into the situation of the things of God, whether it be church or approaching uh, men's breakfast or anything else, if you come into it with any other motive, and motives matter, any other motive, then the benefit of your soul towards holiness you are wrong. Now, this is similar to what he does later over in Matthew 21, verse 12, but he quotes different things there from the Old Testament. So you see a mindset that he doesn't reveal exactly here, but he quotes over there that you have turned this into a house of thieves as opposed to a house of prayer. Well, not even a house of thieves, it says den of thieves. Now we've all heard that, and here in Oklahoma, don't we have like a robber's cave or something like that? I haven't been to it yet, but I want you to understand that this is something that we still have today. What is Robber's Cave? Well, it's when the old outlaws back in the cowboy days used to go hang out inside the cave and count loot and pat each other on the back and hide from the law. So the temple has become exactly that thing that, was, that he quotes from Jeremiah, I believe, chapter 7, Den of Thieves, because he's basically reenacting the entire one man against the system scene from Jeremiah. And so what he does right here, he says, you are working as a den of thieves. The temple has become a place where the thieves, the criminals, they come to hide out and pat each other on the back. And they keep it going because as long as we're all with it, into it together, they can't stop us. Why? Because we got them. What can they do? They got to sacrifice to God. They've got to do it. Evil power uses power this way. They begin to move and maneuver you into the rock and the hard place. Between the, what is it, the old cowboys used to say, the bark and the sap. 
They get you there, and what can you do? They've got you. Because you're going to, a good person, you, you're going to just put up with it to serve God because you've got to do it. And you wonder, when is the day that God's going to change this? You see it happening. You see it going all around. You see it on television. You see it in the world. You see the corruption of the gospel in the United States. When is something going to be done? Well, as prophesied in Malachi, there's always a day when something finally gets done. It gets done one way or the other. Christ will show up and he will set things to right. And you don't want him to come a certain way. You don't want the whip. You don't want the whip. You don't want that. So, but anyway, so that is how the system is working. They got the people. They just got you. Clear and simple. It works. And the system is really good. And they're sitting, not even second-guessing any of it. But Jesus comes to make you second-guess these things. Well, then it says that, uh, the Jews answered and they said, What sign showest thou unto us, seeing thou dost these things? Sign? He... What sign do you show that you can do these things? You need a sign to do what's right? Do, do you need a sign? Do you, be able to, do you have to perform a miracle to be allowed to do what is right and to say what's right and to do what's right? No, you don't need that. But Jesus just performed a miracle in Canaan and he just turned water into wine. You know what Jesus does not say here? He does not say, I just turned water into wine. Because that's not his approach. He's not jumping through their hoops. They have to jump through his and they don't understand that. They think that he has to provide some kind of sign of authority to stop them from doing what's criminal, to stop them from doing what should never be done in the house of God. And that's what people will always do. They will challenge you and make you put, feel like you are put on the spot for trying to stand for right. And it will confuse you and it will scare you and it will make you nervous and you'll question yourself. You'll question your whole business with God. You will question everything. Am I doing what's right? Am I on the right path? They seem like they're against me. Should they all be against me? Shouldn't, shouldn't I be getting some confirmation from the deacon or something? No. Not if you know the word of God. That is the confirmation, that is the sign that you do to perform what is right. But Jesus answers them and he says, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. And that is a whole new sacrificial system. He is referring to his death, resurrection, and burial, which is the very means by which you must have faith in his resurrection and in his death and in him being the Son of God. And that death for your sins, that is our sacrificial system now. Basically, he says, I'll show you the sign. The sign will be that I will tear this whole system down. And I'm also proph prophesying that you're going to be involved in it. You're going to kill me. Now, I do not personally believe that they misunderstood him. I believe they knew exactly what. I believe he probably even used hand gestures. And I'm told by some scholars that in the Greek, it kind of insinuates that he makes it clear to them that he means his temple, that he means his body. I believe that he probably said, you tear this down already knowing their intentions because it will, over in Matthew 21, it will wind up being the reason they want to kill him. I'll say, you do this, and I will show you. I will put up a whole new system here, and they won't need this. I will be the sacrifice. In other words, you sacrifice me, and you will see something happen. Now, i got to ask you, is there a temple in Jerusalem today? No. There's no temple in Jerusalem today. Why? Why? Because in three days after the Romans tore that down, nobody brought it back up, and God could have. So which is harder, to build a building or to bring a man back from the dead? To bring a man back from the dead is infinitely harder than building a building. So they mocked him. They said, this temple was 40 and 6 years in the building. Wilt thou rear, uh, rear it up in three days? So I believe, have you, I believe this is what's happening here. Have you ever been around someone who hates you so much that even though they know what you meant, what you intended, they're going to make it say something else no matter what because they want it to be something evil that you're saying. 
They are looking, they're on the hunt to make every word out your mouth a condemnation of you. So they purposely just don't understand what you're saying. Oh, they understand it's just something really evil though. And you're like, what, what? I can't communicate with this person. Oh, what do you mean you can't communicate with me? What's that mean? Everything is against you no matter what you say. But I believe that the ones directly that he was directly talking to, I believe those, and this would come back, this would not go away. This is brought back up in his trial. They bring back up false witnesses against him saying that he was going to destroy the temple buildings and all these different things. Now it is significant that just before he goes to the cross, I believe within 24 hours, his disciples are showing him all the buildings of the temple and they say, oh look at this, this is incredible. And then Jesus says, all these buildings will be torn down stone by stone. And it never gets back up. It never gets back up. He intends for a total replacement, a total, a total overhaul. And I believe that these people intentionally misunderstand him, but they know they can use this. Now this, I believe, is what plays into them continually later calling him that he's possessed, that he has Beelzebub in him. Because I want you to understand, imagine you're going into the Jews' temple on Passover, and in their minds, they see the corruption as interwoven with their system. So to the simple mind that was there at the temple, they do think Jesus is probably blasphemous. They probably think, that what a wicked man. He's coming in here and throwing this big ruckus in the middle of the temple at the Passover time, disrupting the very animals that will be sacrificed to a holy God. See how they can now use what he said and begin to manipulate it against him to try to turn the people against him. And they continually say, he's demon-possessed. He's evil. Did you see what he did in the temple? And they manipulate and twist. That's why you have to be sharp. You have to understand the scriptures in this way. So, this is what happens. Finally, his disciples realize it said, but he said this meaning the temple of his body. And this is everything. And it also goes on to say that and when he was resurrected, that his disciples remember that he had said this unto them, and that they believed the scriptures and the word which he had said. They believed the scriptures. That is the mark of the disciple. The other day I had a conversation with someone, and then after a while it got a little bit heated, because I told them, you can't be a disciple of Christ and say you listen to the word of Christ and that you follow Christ. And they said all the right words except... They just think the Bible's utterly corrupt. I said, what? Well, how do you know who Jesus is? Well, the Holy Spirit lets me know. Well, how do you know that you're saved? Well, the Holy Spirit lets me know. Well, how do you know that Jesus even died on the cross for you? Oh, the Holy Spirit lets me know. Well, that's strange. The Holy Spirit keeps letting you know all the things that are written in Scripture, except for the part that Jesus says, it is written. And the part where it says in Scripture, the disciples believed the Scripture. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. I believe it's Matthew 4, 4. And this is the whole crux of it right here. Jesus Christ would wind up dying as the ultimate being eaten up for the zeal of the Lord's house. Being consumed is what some of your translations say. Consumed. He literally gets consumed. This act that he does again in Matthew 12, or Matthew 21, will wind up getting him killed. Sometimes you've seen throughout history, people stand for something, they get killed. They shouldn't stand if they're not ready to though. Don't stand unless you're ready to die when it comes to God in particular. So what happens? Jesus Christ does go to the cross. And this comes back to the minds of the disciples. And they remember this time, this beautiful time when this man of courage, the Son of God, stood up to the whole corrupt system and said, you're wrong. Martin Luther would do it years later, back when the church had become corrupt in the medieval times, stands up, rediscovers that the Bible is the authority, looks at him and says, you're wrong. You're wrong. So, that sacrifice was for this reason. The sacrifice is so that 
those who believe that that sacrifice is them, that that was the final act of sacrifice for your sins, they now become part of that temple that was destroyed. They become a part of his body. They become a part of that body that is now resurrected. And in baptism, you know, so you ever hear what the preacher mutters over you when you go down into the, to the water? Buried with him in death, raised with him in newness of life. You, you, it's kind of old timey. The old timers used to do it all the time. Anyone ever heard a preacher say that? You become part of his body. In his death, your sins are crucified to the cross. And in the resurrection, you become part of the resurrected body. And then Paul takes it a step further. And for those who have been cleansed and have faith in that, here's the final answer. Now you are an acceptable living sacrifice before God. That excludes convenience in the matters of God. The form of your life is a living sacrifice unto God. And this means holiness. Well, it's not very popular these days. It's going out of style. People don't do altar calls much anymore. When I go around, I've, I've seen a lot of churches. I assume Spencer still does altar calls around here, right? Here's what you need to know. I'm going to give a short offer call here in just a second. This is the altar call. You want Christ to come into your temple and you want him to cleanse it from all the unrighteousness, all the hypocrisy, all the falseness, all the corruption. You want to be saved. You want to be saved. And for those of you who do know the Lord and your spirit bears witness with the spirit that you are a child of God and it cries, Abba, Father, within your heart, you also need to be careful. When you let sin grow within you, the time of cleansing comes because he loves you. And sometimes he does come into the Christian's life with a whip. And he will cleanse their life. If you be a judge of yourself, he won't have to judge you. So the same thing that saves you is the same thing that keeps you. You're holding to the sacrifice. And living clean, you can do that.